Phillips screwdriver, a great invention for putting screws in and taking screws out. It was invented in 1923 by an employee of the Ford Motor Company so that, that screws could be taken out easily. Well, the PH in Phillips stands for push hard because you had to push hard to get that screw in. And uh, it was better than the old screwdriver, but not as good as what we got today, right? So now we got our power screwdriver, a better tool for getting the job done. All right, there we go. So the Phillips screwdriver is like our limit definition of the derivative. If we've got a function like y equals x squared and we want to find the slope of the tangent line at any point, we can use the formal definition or the limit definition of the derivative. It works. We have to kind of press hard to get it done. We had to push through, but we can get it done. Great tool, that formal definition, but now we need a better tool to get it done. So we're gonna look at some shortcuts so that we can find out that the derivative of this y equals x squared is 2x so that we can quickly find derivatives and we can generalize things and we can use derivatives for lots of important things in math and science. So let's get to it. We like shortcuts. So let's dig into it and see if we can find some patterns that can give us some shortcuts. All right, so we know that as we just talked about, the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, also known as the instantaneous rate of change. So how quickly it's changing at a very moment. Lots of ways to write the derivative. Remember that all of these are the same f prime of x, d dx of f of x, or y prime, or d dx times y, or dy dx here, lots of ways to write this. And they all have some different purposes and work in better in different ways. All right, so we, we, we have some specific rules here that we've kind of, uh, that we're gonna explore. Some of them we've kind of discovered some things about. The constant rule, what if we have a constant? What if we have x to some power here? What if we have the derivative of sine, whoops. And what if we have the derivative of cosine? So those are specific rules. Then we're gonna have some general rules that talk about, well, what if we have a function that is multiplied by a constant here? What, what do we do with that constant? What if we have two functions being added, a sum of functions there? So those are general rules. All right, so important quick thing to clarify is that when we say dy dx, well, that's a noun, that's a thing. So dy dx is the derivative of y with respect to x. If we say d dx, that's a verb. It's kind of like an operator. It's saying take the derivative of that thing. So when we say d dx of this, that means we need to find the derivative of this function, find the derivative of this. But if we say I have dy dx, that means this is the derivative, all right? So some notation things to get used to there. So the first thing we want to look at is, uh, what if we have a, a, a constant like f of x equals 3? What's the derivative? Well, here's the graph of f of x equals 3. And if we pick any point here, the slope of that line there is, uh, at that point, is uh, 0, right? The slope at this point is 0. The slope at this point is zero. So it doesn't matter where you go, the slope is zero, and the slope is the derivative. So we have a rule. When we take the derivative of a constant, we get zero, all right? So that's our rule, okay, easy. All right, let's get a little more challenging. What if we have a, a, a power? So x to some power, that's a power function. Well, we've seen, we've done the limit definition or the formal definition, and we've seen that the derivative of y equals x squared is dy dx equals 2x. And, but what if we have just a general x to the n? So we're gonna investigate that, but we need to, to talk about the binomial theorem for a moment here. So we need the binomial theorem to do a proof here in a second, but I'm going to, to cut this part out and put it in a different video. So we're gonna jump here now to talk about how the binomial theorem 
works. And um, so we're going to cut this out. If you want to watch how, where this uh, binomial theorem, how it works, check the other video out. And the reason this is useful is these are the coefficients, all right? So uh, this is, these are the coefficients here of a plus b squared. That's going to be 1a squared, 2ab, 1b squared. And so this is squared, cubed, fourth power, fifth power, sixth power, seventh power. If we wanted to know the a plus b to the seventh, we're going to have this guy, a squared, oh, no, actually a to the seventh, because we're talking seven, plus, and then, then it's just going to go down. The, a, the, the exponents on the a goes down and the b goes up, b to the first. Uh, then we're going to have a to the fifth, b to the second. Then we're going to have a to the fourth, b cubed. Then we're going to have, uh, moving on over, continue the pattern. You hopefully get the idea the a's are going down, the b's are going up. A's are going down, b's are going up. And we'll get all of our terms, and so we can know exactly what it is. Now, this is, again, a great background, uh, good to know, especially those of you that are going to continue on in math. Uh, everyone else, I'm uh, just going to breathe deep and, and say, wow, that's amazing. Um, and uh, let's see that we, if we can use that. Okay, the key is knowing that this exists, because let's, let's go discover the rule for the derivative of x to the n. All right, here we go. Going to be a lot of algebra, but this is going to develop our power tool so that we don't have to do this anymore. So using the limit definition, here we go. The limit as h goes to 0, and we're going to go kind of fast here, but uh, if you want to pause the video and rewind, uh, uh, you might be, feel free to do that. So we want the limit of um, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, right? So there's our limit definition. It's always nice to write that down first so we can remember where we're going. Now let's go ahead and the, the function itself is x to the n. Okay, so we're going to have, uh, don't forget my limit, limit as h goes to 0 of, and we have uh, x plus h to the nth power minus uh, x to the n all over h. Now, here's where all of that binomial theorem is going to come in. So we need to figure out, how do I do x plus h to the n? Well, uh, n, what is n? Is n the second power or the seventh power or the twentieth power? Well, uh, n could be any power. Okay, so what do we do with that? Well, let's just think about what it looks like here. All right, um, I'm going to copy down this minus x to the n uh, from over here. Okay, we, we got that. Now, notice that all of these, if I have x to the uh, a plus b to the seventh, it starts with a to the seventh. If I have a plus b to the uh, second, it starts with a squared, 1a squared. And the next one's going to be 1a cubed if we write it out, 1a to the fourth, 1a to the fifth. Right? Uh, so no matter what the degree is there, uh, we're going to start with the, one, uh, the first thing to that power. And then we're going to end with the second thing to that power. Right? So, and we're going to have a bunch of other products in between. So that tells us that the first term will be x to the n. The second term, notice this, the second term in all of these, let's actually go up to these ones up top. Look at the second term. If we had the second degree, a plus b squared, we had uh, the second term was a 2ab. The next one to the third power was a 3a squared b. Next one was a 4 right here, 4a cubed b. The next one is a fifth, so on and so forth, right? So fifth degree, that term, that, that uh, coefficient is five. So our next term is going to be not a coefficient of one, two, three, or five. It'll be a coefficient of n. And then we'll have x to the n minus one times h to the first, all right? 
Now, the next terms, are there's going to be a whole bunch in here. I don't know what n is, so I don't know how many terms there will be. But I know that they will all have h to something bigger than 2. So h to something here, and this question mark will be bigger than 2, right? So keep that in mind. Okay, and then we'll end up with uh, this minus x to the n. And there will be, uh, let's go ahead and throw, we, we know we're going to have a, at the last one will be a 1h to the n. So uh, all of this stuff right here is, is going to kind of disappear, as we'll see in just a moment. So that's our fudge factor here. So well, here's what we have. The limit as h goes to 0, well, these all cancel out here, right? x to the n cancels out with a minus x to the n. And that leaves us with nx to the n minus 1 times h plus all of this junk that has an h to the question mark that's, that this is of order 2 or greater, okay, divided by h. Now, to simplify this, we have a bunch of terms here and a single term here. Remember that we divide h into all of these, all of these h terms here. Everything's going to get divided by h to the first. And that's going to leave us with limit as h goes to 0. And the first term will be nx to the n minus 1 plus, and then all of these, since they had at least h to the 2 or greater, will have h to the first or greater. Okay? So there are going to be a bunch of terms here that will be uh, at least h to the first. Now the question is, what happens when h goes to infinity? I'm sorry, to 0. Well, when h goes to 0, these guys all go to 0. And they all go to 0, and that leaves us with this guy, the, uh, uh, this does not have an h term, so we have n times x to the n minus 1. So, there you have it, uh, and we have just proven that the derivative of uh, x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1, and we never have to do that again. We've got our power tool, our first power tool. All right. So here's our tool. We have the power rule right here. It says if we have x to the n, all we do to find the derivative is we drop the n down and we write n minus 1 as our new power. And that will be the, the derivative, all right? Now, the function must be differentiable, all right? Uh, and it must be a number so that we can, we can actually take n minus 1, all right? So, all right. Um, so what does that mean? That means this. We have uh, x to the fifth. Well, we're going to take this 5, and we're going to drop it downstairs to take the derivative, and we're going to subtract 1, and we get 4. There it is. The derivative of x to the fifth is 5x to the fourth. Well, what if we have a x in the denominator? Well, let's rewrite this as a power. This is x to the negative second. So the derivative of x to the negative 7, let's drop that down. We get negative 2x and subtract 1. What's negative 2 minus 1? That's negative 3. Now, we always want to uh, write our final answer with positive exponents in most cases. So let's take that negative exponent back downstairs. So we write it as an exponent and then use the power rule. So one more, d dx uh, of the square root of x. Well, the square root of x is x to the 1 half, right? So let's take that power. It drops down to take our derivative, 1 half x. And 1 half minus a half is negative a half. Sorry, 1 half minus 1, right? So our rule, once again, is we're going to drop 
the exponent down, the exponent goes down in front, and we subtract one to get our new exponent. And so we want to write this as one half times, well, x to the negative one half is one over x to the one half. And we might actually want to write that as a square root just to make it a little prettier. This is one over two times the square root of x. And that's one you might want to memorize. The derivative of x squared, or the square root of x, d dx of the square root of x is one over two squared of x. That should go on a note card. All right, well, lots of stuff there. Uh, we'll probably pause the video there and, and we'll pick the rest up uh, on another video here. So uh, great job. And we'll continue from there to find some more rules to make life a whole lot easier. Let's look at some trig functions and see what their derivative looks like. So for sine, here's our sine wave we should be familiar with. And we, we notice that at pi over 2 here, the derivative is going to be 0 because the tangent line is 0, so pi over 2 is 0. At 3 pi over 2, the derivative is 0. At negative pi over 2, it's 0. And over here at negative 3 pi over 2, it's 0. Then notice this. The derivative there at 0 is looks like about 1. And it is, and we can prove that if we want to take the time to right now. But not right now. Uh, we have 2 pi. The slope is 1. It's going to be up there. And over here at uh, negative 2 pi, the slope is up at 1. The slope right here at negative pi and at pi is negative 1. And if we connect those with a nice curve, do you recognize that graph? That is the graph of the cosine of x. So the derivative of sine looks like the cosine of x. That sure looks like it. My graph's not very pretty there, but uh, that's the idea. How about uh, the, the uh, derivative of, of cosine? So if we look at cosine at 0, that point, the derivative is 0, because the tangent line has a slope of 0. At pi, the slope is 0. At negative pi, and uh, at 2 pi, the slope is 0. And at negative 2 pi, the slope is 0. Then at, uh, let's see, negative pi over 2, the slope is 1, positive 1. 3 pi over 2, the slope is positive 1. Slope at negative pi over 2 is down here at negative 1. I'm sorry, pi over 2 is negative 1. Negative 3 pi over 2 is at negative 1. And here's our graph here. So let's see what we got here. So we got a graph that looks something like this. Well, what's this graph look like? Well, it goes through 0, 0, so it looks a whole lot like a sine wave, right? But notice it's going down, so that's going to be negative. It's flipped over. All right, so we have a hypothesis here that sine, the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Well, let's see if we can prove that. So uh, we're going to use our formal definition of the derivative. And we have the limit as h goes to 0 of sine x plus h minus sine x all over h. Now we've got to remember some trig identities here. Uh, we can't just distribute the sine. It doesn't work that way. But we have some identities that tells us what the sine of x plus h is worth, or another way that we can write it. So we got our limit as h goes to 0 still. And this is going to be, this is, you might have remember, a sine of u plus v, sine of u times cosine of v plus sine u cosine, or plus sine v cosine u, or some version of that you learned. So sine of the first times the cosine of the second. And then plus uh, sine of the second times the cosine of the first. Right. And then we have minus sine x all over h. Now, this is looking good because we only have a sine of x, a cosine of h, a sine of x, a cosine of h, so on and so forth. So they're all sine and cosine of one value. Let's do a little rearranging here. 
So if we rearrange this, we have the limit as h goes to zero. And let's put these two sine x's together. So we have a sine x there and a sine x there. So sine x cosine h minus sine x plus sine h cosine x all over h. Then let's uh, go ahead and do a little factoring here. Still got our limit. We haven't dealt with that yet. So we have sine x. Let's pull sine x out of these two terms. So we, we have cosine h minus 1. And I'm going to put that all over h. I'm going to break this up at the same time. Sine h cosine x all over h. Okay. Now, what's going on here? Well, we know what this is, right? As h goes to 0, that is worth 0. We also have learned what that fraction is right there. As h goes to 0, this fraction is going to 1. And this is going to 0. So we now have, as h goes to 0, we have sine x uh, times 0 plus 1 times cosine x. And this part goes away, leaving us with cosine x. There you go. We've just proven that the derivative of sine is cosine. All right, let's try the next one. Derivative of cosine of x. Well, let's use our formal definition again here. We've got the limit. Cosine of x plus h minus cosine x all over h. We again need to change the way this looks, so we think back to our trig identities, and there was a uh, cosine sum. The formula for the cosine, or the identity, is that this is equal to cosine x cosine h, and then for cosine, the sine changes, and we have sine x sine h minus cosine x. And that's all over h. Now let's do a little rearranging in a similar kind of way. Which of these kind of match up? Uh, we have cosine x there and cosine x there. So let's put those together and do a little factoring. See what we can come up with. So we got the limit. We've got our cosine x minus sine x together here. And we're going to factor there, so let's do a little factoring. So we get that cosine minus 1. That's what we're kind of looking for there. So we've got um, a limit again. So we'll factor out this cosine. And again, I'm going to go ahead and divide both of these. This set here, this, this with the blue parentheses, divide that by h and divide this by h. So we're splitting it into two fractions with that common denominator of h. So sine x, sine h, all over h. Then we know what this is worth as h goes to 0. So we recognize that limit there. And then we have the limit of sine h over h. This part here is going to 0. This part is going to 1. So finally, at the limit, we have cosine of x times 0 minus sine x times 1. And that's how we prove, well, almost proven, we're almost done here. This is going to go away because of the 0. And so we have minus or negative sine x. There it is. Derivative of cosine is sine, uh, negative sine, sorry. And derivative of sine is cosine. So a nice connection there between these two. And they, they do have something to do with each other, and, and, and it has to do with the derivative. All right. So when we're taking the derivative here, we're going to take the derivative of these two parts separately. So this is going to be derivative of sine is cosine of x, and then minus 2 times the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine. And then we'd probably like to clean those negatives up. 
So 5 cosine x plus 2 sine x. Okay? All right. Then B, we've got one more here. Well, derivative of 3t to the fifth, that's going to use our power rule. So that's going to be 15t to the fourth. And then 2 times the derivative of cosine, which is sine. So we have 2 times negative sine, that is, of t. So we have 15t to the fourth minus 2 sine t. There you have it. Derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. That's how you find derivatives with trig functions.